So the sessions this week will all run as Zoom meetings rather than Zoom webinars. So that means you can see the other people on the call if they've got their video on. Uh, you can chat to them and you can interact with them. So please, uh, please do use the chat function. We've made it available for questions or for uh, conversing with other, the other attendees. Um, but please note that if we do see any inappropriate use of the chat function, um, that may result in you being removed from the session or having your chat function being disabled. And we'll be operating according to the Code of Conduct for the conference, uh, which Holly will put a link to in the chat, I hope, uh, in case you need to refer to it. Um, please keep your microphones muted until the, uh, until the, um, the open discussion starts. Um, and as this is our very first session of the conference, um, please bear with us with any technical difficulties that we might have. But otherwise, um, we will get going and I will just continue to be the one speaking. And so, Today, what I'd like to start with is the organisation that is TADWIG, or also called Biodiversity Information Standards. I'm going to describe who we, who's involved and what we do. Um, we'll also talk a little about the conferences and provide some details about, the TADWIG, about TADWIG 2020. And the photograph on this slide is from the conference we held last year in Leiden in the Netherlands, which was attended by over 600 people. Our generous hosts were the Naturalis Museum, which only just opened after renovations in time to greet us. And we were told that the paint in some of the rooms was still drying as we first walked in the door. We're hoping that this year's conference will be just as large, but unfortunately, we won't be able to be all in the same, the same room at the same time. But we're hoping it will still be good. So there's two introduction to TADWIG sessions. Um, and you've, after you've heard from me, I'll be very pleased to introduce Marika, um, who I've uh, done a quick intro to already. And then Paula will speak and James will speak as well. Deb, who's also shown on this slide, will attend the second, uh, the second of the two sessions, but won't join us for this one. Um, although she, she is actually still up instead of being asleep. The plan for the session is to do 10 minutes of one of us talking and then five minutes for question time. Sorry, someone just muted me. That was very tricky of them. Um, so uh, 10 minutes of one of us talking and then five minutes for questions. And at the end of the presentations, we've got plenty of time left for discussion. We've also started a shared document uh, and you can find it at the um, address up here, or I think Holly will also put that link into the chat as well. We'd love it if you could start to contribute on that document. So for ongoing communication with Tadwick, you can uh, use our Twitter handle, which is at Tadwick, or check Facebook. So, who is, who is TADWIG or the Biodiversity Information Standwig, Standards? Everybody still calls us TADWIG, uh, even though it hasn't been called by its full name that the acronym TADWIG stands for, for, for quite some time. And it's grown a lot to encompass much more than uh, when it was originally, when TADWIG was originally formed back in 1985. So TADWIG is a not-for-profit scientific and education association focused on establishing international collaboration between really anyone who's interested in biodiversity information. Our core work is the development of standards that are used to promote wider and more effective dissemination and operability of information. But it's not just standards, it's also implementation and adoption, as well as, as, as expanding to the wider biodiversity informatics community. So to achieve its goals, Tadwick develops, ratifies and promotes standards and guidelines for the recording and exchange of data about organisms. And it also acts as a forum for discussing all aspects of biodiversity information through meetings, online discussions and publications. So the standards that you're most likely to have heard of from Tadwick are standards, standards like Darwin Core and ABCD. So in simple terms, these describe the what, when and where of a species occurrence record. 
what is the organism identified as, where was it found, and when was it found? But that's all I'm going to say about standards because the standards are the topic for Marika's talk. So she will take it from there. So who is Tadwig? Tadwig's core work, as I said, is the, is the development of standards, but that work requires participation by and collaboration with people from many domains, even beyond the typical biodiversity, biology and ge geoscience disciplines. We've got taxonomists, informaticians, computer scientists, and everybody offers something different into the standards discussion. The Tadwig structure, Tadwig's myth, mission, structure, membership and governance are established in its constitution. Members elect officers to an executive committee, which then man, manages the organisation. And James, who'll be speaking later, is the current chair of the executive committee. Many of the people in the session uh, in, who are on the executive are with us today in the session. Um, not quite sure how many, but quite a few. And maybe they'll also identify themselves in the chat. And you'll see some of them pop up in later slides. There are also, um, alongside the office bearers, Tadwick has a number of regional representatives. So some key members for connecting might be, your, the, the person you want to talk to first might be your regional rep. And as I said at the start, I'm the rep for Oceania. And also on the call today, as I say, are Holly, who's the representative for North America, and Paula, who's the representative for South America. So feel free to reach out to any of us. In addition to the executive committee, the work is done and maintained by the interest groups and the task groups. And Paula's gonna give more details in her talk about what those groups do. So I won't go into it here. And then of course, there's the members. In typical years, you might have become a member during the conference registration process. And we hope that despite the change of venue, you will still consider a membership with Tadwig this year as well. You can come, become an individual member or your institution might want to join. And Holly will put a link to some of the membership information into the chat. So the community is vast and you don't have to be a member to participate. Before, we showed a, a, I showed a, a diagram with just a few bubbles of the intersecting domains of Tadwig, but that was a really simplified uh, view of the Tadwig web. In this network diagram, each node is a person and their connections were based on the abstracts um, and the co-authorship of abstracts. You can see it's a pretty complex web. Communi community collaboration is essential to Tadwig and our community extends far beyond formal membership. Tadwig's a volunteer driven organisation that continues to, be, to strive to be welcoming and inclusive. And it's really vital, we see it's really vital that Tadwig um, actively engage with individuals, projects and inter institutions that, that utilise and contribute to the standards, best practices and tools developed and maintained by Tadwig. And so we really want to have perspectives from all across the biodiversity and geodiversity landscape. And we want to create an environment that fosters innovation and learning and for Tadwig to grow along with, its, along with its community. One of the best ways to develop community is to attend conferences. And Tadwig's annual conferences are usually held at around this time of the year and occupy a full working week, Monday to Friday. So our annual conferences serve two purposes. Firstly, to provide a forum for developing, refining and extending standards in response to new challenges, opportunities and opportunities. And secondly, to provide a showcase for biodiversity informatics, much of which relies on the standards created by Tadwig and by other organisations. From a personal perspective, one of the advantages of attending the Tadwig conference is that we, all, we publish all of the abstracts in a digital journal called BIS. So all of the abstracts are peer reviewed and that project has just been going on in the background um, in preparation for the second half of this meeting, which will be in October. So all the abstracts are peer reviewed, they're published online and they all get a DOI, uh, which means that, uh, and it also provides an opportunity to link the slide decks, presentations, posters and videos. Uh, you, so you can link those in and you can get a really comprehensive and lasting record of your participation. So since we're virtual this year, the format has changed somewhat, but the goals are still the same. And we hope that you'll be able to join us both during this week uh, and in October when we reconvene 
for a, the other part of the conference, which is more of the standard conference presentation of talks uh, and responses. So there'll still be lots of uh, opportunity to meet people and uh, discuss things, we hope, in this online environment. Um, and we hope that we can engage you all in some discussion this week. So that's, that's the first presentation done, which is the introduction to the introduction. Uh, Holly, can I check in to see if there's any questions that have come up through the chat so far? I haven't noted any yet, but I am sure people are considering what they might ask coming up. <laughs> Excellent. In that case, we might throw directly to Marika um, to tell us a bit more about standards. Over to you, Marika. Yes, I will um, share my screen. <clears throat> hmm. It took longer than expected. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, thanks um, for the introduction and also from, from Berlin, from Germany, a warm welcome to um, TEDWIC. And in the next couple of minutes, um, I will tell you a bit about standards and um, what they can do for us actually and how do we develop them uh, in TEDWIC. So what is a standard? If you Google standard, uh, you might find an image of an old car or you might find an image of a bar, um, which I regularly visited during my studies, uh, which had also the name standard. But there's, of course, actually more. There is an Austrian newspaper, but it's um, also kind of an established norm. And I think this is um, the direction uh, we are thinking of a standard as well in Tetrick. Uh, technically, it's an established norm or requirement. Um, it is usually a formal document that establishes uniform engineering, etc. So, it... Ellie, can you mute yourself? I don't know if I've just turned myself back on because um, they are, we're getting messages through the chat to say that uh, people can't see your presentation. Can you see my presentation? I can see your presentation, but <laughs> others can't. <laughs> we're, we're not looking at your, at your presenter's view. Oh, okay. That's weird. Sorry. I will put it on another screen. Maybe this helps. Can you see anything now or nothing? Now my Zoom window is away. <laughs> you have to share, share your... Yeah. No, yeah, it's fine. I, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, maybe you can just talk a bit and tease some questions. I have to um, open the presentation again. Or oh, somebody else maybe can share my story. That, yeah, that would be nice. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Um, okay. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry, we wanted to avoid this next slide, but yeah, now we have it. Okay, so we have an old car, which um, is called standard, but there's also a bar. Next slide. 
and everything else um, like a newspaper and things like next slide please okay but uh, we are um, next slide <laughs> okay so but um, we are talking about a more in a standards in a more technical way so it's a kind of established norm or requirement and if it's coming to data standards it's actually just a data scheme which is universally comprehensible and um, if it's coming to metadata standards, so the standards which are more or less describing the standards, it's a common understanding of the meaning and the semantics of the data. So everybody can understand uh, it's in a correct way and it allows a proper use and interpretation of the data by you, the owner, but also by um, the users. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what can this actually do for us? So um, this is a slide you have already seen in Eddie's presentation. You have data stored in a content management system in your Excel spreadsheet. Next slide, please. If you use then a data standard, you can actually do many funny things with it. Next slide, please. You can do some uh, common quality checks. You can share them with other people. You can publish them. You can connect them with other data and you can analyze them also in a common way. So everybody can understand your data. You, um, other people, but also the computers can do. And I think this is really, really important that not only you understand what your Excel column means, but also others do if you're using data standards. Next slide, please. So, but where are they actually coming from? So there's uh, this uh, worldwide really huge uh, organization called uh, W3C, um, which is really important when it's coming to uh, standards from the World Wide Web. When it's coming to um, biodiversity standards, TEDRIC is um, the most important organization and of course there are also many others from other domains but i think the, those two are the most important ones next slide please now um where it is really actually coming from it's not just an organization who's thinking oh we need to make a new standard so it's coming out of an idea so somebody has an idea in mind that um, i want to share publish a um, set of data and uh, I don't know how to do that. And so maybe there is no standard I can use. So in the TED, under the TEDRIC umbrella, um, those um, guy, girl, um, needs to create an interest group so that um, they are really, with other people together, they are interested in developing a new standard. Out of this um, group, they are creating a task group those kind of interest and task group will be presented a bit more detail in Paula's talk. So um, just there's these names, but uh, what their really objectives are will be um, part of the next talk. And so they create a task group, they write a charter, what is the standard about, why it is useful. And um, then the technical architecture group, a really important body of TEDRIC, will kind of review it and see if this standard is really important, if those people cannot use anything which is already available, and if it is really interoperable with any other developments uh, taking place in TEDRIC and beyond. So if they agree on it, um, they can create a standard, they will publish a draft standard in GitHub, and then a long process starts, which is the ratification. It's just not one simple step. Next slide, please. Um, the most important part here in this graph is just that there are different people involved. There's an executive committee, which was already presented by Ellie, who is this is but also there are two reviews one expert review which is comparable to any peer review of a journal article so we some experts are invited to review this standard but secondly there's also a public review so everybody can contribute to the development of a new standard next slide please so if uh, everybody in the end is then happy, um, you can get um, the ratification by Tetric and have a new standard. Of course, there needs to be some, some maintenance. Um, so a kind of maintenance group can be founded as well. And at some point, the standard might be somehow outdated and no longer be in use and it could be retired. But this as well uh, needs to be done uh, 
together or by the technical architecture group. Next slide, please. So, um, Ellie already mentioned that um, we are this kind of biodiversity data organization. So, of course, the two main standards are tackling those um, information. So, information about observation and collection objects. We are having Darwin Core and ABCD access to biological collection data as the main standards. Um, you have information on the record level, so which kind of institution is holding this specimen, for example, information on the gathering event, where was it found, who did it collect, etc. but also from the identification, so the taxonomic background and also geological context. There's more information available on those to websites, but also there's a Darwin Core Hour series where you have introduction to those standards, but also to others as well. Next slide, please. But of course, there are also, there are more standards developed under the umbrella of TEDWIC, which is um, an extension for Darwin Core and ABCD as well. That's the GGBN, that's for genomic samples. Then we have media um, from the Audipo, or, from the Audubon core. Then we have the collection description standards, which is helping us to describe collections by himself. So not the, the items, but the whole collections. And there's more information on the TEDWIC website, but as well from, there's a nice metadata standard catalog available on that, uh, via that link, not only the TEDWIC standards, but others as well. Next slide, please. So, but if you want to publish your data, like from the beginning on, you don't necessarily need several standards. So if you want have one set of data, like um, for example, observation data, you can use Darwin Core and ABCD and publish those data in different portals. So like the research data could be in some research portal, which is in Germany, GF Bio. Then you have maybe some images um, of your um, observation or of your collection object and um, several European natural history museums made their images and also sound files available and on the platform Europeana, which is the European digital library. Um, but also fossils and um, meteorites or um, minerals in the geocase portal. And last but not least, maybe the most important one from our community, which is the GBIF portal for biodiversity information data. So you just need this one single standard to publish it in different um, ways and to make it available for a broader audience. Next slide, please. And if you're interested in standards and their development, um, there are several sessions this week, um, like today the Audubon core group will meet and the collection description task group later on, but also tomorrow and on Wednesday and on Friday as well. Um, tomorrow there's an alignment group, which is really important now, a close alignment between ABCD and Darwin core developments. And on Wednesday also the maintenance group of Darwin core. Next slide, please. But also in October, there are several symposia which are um, tackling the standards issue. Um, the um, final program is not yet available, but these are some of the sessions that might be of interest. Next slide and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, a great presentation despite technical trickeries, which we... <laughs> <laughs> We're bound to have eventually. Yes. Holly, can I throw to you? Do we have any questions that have come through from the chat? No questions yet. Still no questions. We have to have a prize for the person who asks the first question, I think. I'll give you two more minutes, two more minutes. Uh, you are, uh, we, we have several people um, on the call as well who um, uh, speak Spanish. So if, and William has put a message in Spanish, except it's gone to the waiting room, William, um, instead of to everyone in here. Uh, so um, if you would feel more comfortable asking your question in Spanish, you would be very welcome to do that. But it still didn't prompt anybody. 
So, um, should we now go to Paula to hear more about? Oh, there we go. We have a Did question. You have a question. Yes. <laughs> Um, Paula, it's probably one for you. What is the number of people uh, that normally forms a maintenance and or task group? Well, I guess at least two. <laughs> We're going to see that very soon. But an interest group or task group has to have a convener, which has a coordination role and some core members. So I don't want to say what I'm going to say in a couple of minutes, but basically the groups are meant to do something. So they generally benefit from having uh, as many active people as possible, right? If we're actually working on things, but with different views of different perspectives. So there is no minimum number, probably a convener and at least one core member aside from the convener. And there is no maximum number to it. Thank you. Uh, we did have another question which Marika has already answered in the chat, but um, would you, so the question was when recording minerals, which standard should we use? Did you want to add to what you put in the chat, Marika? Yeah, I already put it in the chat. It's an extension of um, ABCD, uh, which can um, tackle minerals. Uh, it's currently under ratification. But still, it's still, uh, it's already a working standard. So it's, uh, it can be used for published, for example, data in the GeoCase portal. And if you are interested in those kind of develop, uh, developments, I'm, you could join our tomorrow's meeting. Holly, when was it? It's at? Uh, 1700 UTC. Great, excellent. Okay, so I think we might now um, go to Paula's talk. Okay, so I'll try to share my screen, but you tell me in advance if I'm doing something wrong. So, let's see. Do you see my screen, Nora? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is a uh, brief overview about interest groups and task groups within Tadwin. So, basically, what is uh, what is an interest group and what is a task group? Well, it's a group of people, right, that get together to accomplish something related with standards. That's in kind of simple words. So. What they are interested in doing is one of the core functions of TADWIC, which is the developing and maintenance of biodiversity information standards. And so the interest groups have two main uh, purposes or goals, which are one is to provide a basis for, for discussing problems and potential strategies and methods that we can adopt and application of, of generic technologies. And the other one is to maintain the products of the task groups that have been part of that interest group. And so what are task groups? Task groups are groups within interest groups that are tasked with a particular, uh, with developing a particular product within a given time frame. So task groups are created to do something in particular that is related with the activities of a given interest group. So we might have from zero, maybe, to many task groups within a single interest group. So there are two kinds, of, I'm going to mention here now that there might be two, there are two kinds of interest groups in Tadwick. Those are the, what we call the normal interest groups, and then there are the maintenance interest groups. And those are meant to maintain standards that have already been ratified. Okay. I'm going to show you which are the two, which are Darwin Core and Audubon Core, are the two maintenance groups that we currently have under the TADWIC. So as Mareka was mentioning before, to establish an interest group or a task group, we have to build a charter. And in that charter, that charter is a document where we set the goals of the group, which is 
going to be the, the operation of it, which is the background that justifies the activities that we want to, to perform, the, the, how, are, how and why are we going to develop uh, the standard that we want to develop. And something very important is establishing how to get involved in those groups. That's how to participate. How can people come to the groups and provide their expertise and, and and be part of this process of development and maintaining standards. So in these charters, we set a person that is the coordinator of the group, who is the convener. And then there is a list of core members. This is related to what was asked before. That can be from one to many, right? There is no, no limit in the number of core members that uh, the group can have. Uh, however, it is expected that the core members would be active in the group. So core member will be some, someone that is working on the thing that the group is supposed to work on. And there are, of course, other members because all interest groups and task groups are open to everyone. So we don't need to be experts to participate in the activities of an interest group or task group. And we can just come and take a look and see what the interest groups are doing and if we're interested in those activities, if we have something to contribute, we can be like other members just looking at it and get involved as we can or as we deem appropriate. So those other members of the bigger community are also super important for the work of these groups. So I'm not gonna talk much about the process of establishing and, and keeping these groups, but in the, on that slide, you can see the, the link to the process, the TAWIC process, where all of this is explained. So, I'll pass the next one. I, I'm, I'm going to show you just the names of the interest groups and task groups. I'm not going to go into each one because right now we have 17 and this is just an intro, but I invite you to go to the community site on the TAWIC webpage and uh, get acquainted with the activities of each one. So in these slides, you will see the names of the interest groups and also a teeny icon, a globe icon that is showing which of the interest groups have meetings uh, during this week. And so that's a group of them. And this is another group of, of interest groups. I will let it sit there just for one second more so that you can read the names, but Again, please visit the web page. And here I show you uh, task groups that are currently active within some of the interest groups. So we now have 12 task groups plus one because there is one that is listed there that has not yet been formally approved, but that has a session during this, this week as well. So I invite you to, to review the, the agenda for this week and try to get um, to those sessions that are going to be super, super interesting. So how, how does the, um, how does it look, uh, the, the page for a particular uh, group? I chose here just an example that is the Biodiversity Data Quality Interest Group. So if you go to the web webpage, you will find a page for each interest group. And in that page, you will find the elements, the basic elements of the charter of that group. For instance, the rationale, who are the conveners and co-conveners and who are the core members and how to become involved. And those, those uh, most important elements of the group. You will also find linked all the task groups. If you're looking at an interest group, here is shown at the, at the right of the screen. And I, I would like you to notice that there is a button that is linked to GitHub repository. As it was mentioned before, GitHub is, uh, is our way to communicate and organize the development of standards. So each one of the interests has a GitHub repository under the Tadwick GitHub organization repo. So you can visit each one there and you will see that each interest group manages their documents, their activities in a slightly different way in their own repos, but everyone has one, has one repository. So it's important that you also, you, you don't just stay at the web page, you go and see the actual activities 
in those uh, repositories. So how does how do the interests and task groups uh, how, how are they uh, overseen? So there are two instances or two um, groups that oversee the, the activities of the groups. One is the executive committee, which is, um, which is the one that evaluates the charters and the annual reports that each group has to provide, uh, explaining the progress towards their goals. And the executive committee also can structure groups so that the priorities of TADWIC are, are best uh, accommodated. And then the other group that oversees the groups, the task groups and interest groups, is the technical architecture group. And their function here is to, among others, is to evaluate, technically speaking, the charters and the reports and to coordinate the activities of different interest groups, right? To keep them communicated and keep them working together if they if they have to or if they should. So in here, to be very brief, I put uh, again the uh, a piece of the agenda for this week, where you can see all the interest groups that are going to hold meetings and all the task groups. So I invite you to come and, and join us in this in these sessions. Again, you don't have to be an expert to come. You can come and see what the groups are about. Okay, ask your questions. So the conveners and the members are are very willing to to hear your voices and and answer your your questions about their their activities and goals. So get in contact, share your opinions, uh, join existing task groups and interest groups, or maybe propose your own new ones. And remember, this is just a reminder. Uh, this is not just this week. Keep in mind that Taiwan has another week and the results of the work of the interest groups many times are also presented during the, the virtual conference. So keep that day in mind. And that will be it. We do have one question in the chat. Sorry, Ellie. Go ahead. Are you going to read it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. Um, interest groups and task groups are bottom up approaches. Is there also a top down strategy on Tadwig standards who guide those activities? You want to take that one, James? <laughs> From <the> top down? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure if we have an example of a top down. Um, I think most of these things are grassroots. I'm going to address that just a little bit in a minute. But uh, most of them come from grassroots, from new communities evolving or just needs that uh, become obvious. Um, so I would say no, I don't believe that we do any top down. We are simply part of a, you know, a mechanism that produces the standard. Do we have any other questions coming through? Not yet. Not yet, no. So maybe James, we might throw to you. Um, so James is our last presenter. Uh, so please um, get, your, um, get your questions ready or get your um, anything that you would like to say ready uh, um, for after James has presented, we will have an, we can have an open discussion uh, and uh, we would very much like um, participation from the floor because otherwise we will just have to speak to each other. And that's not nearly as exciting as talking to you. So over to you, James. All right, thank you very much. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, I'm getting nods. Okay, well, I'd say good morning on my, my part of the world, but uh, afternoon and evening to others. 
Uh, it's wonderful to see. I think we have over 60 people joining us here. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see the enthusiasm. And I, I'd really like to welcome the people who are new to TADWIG. Uh, as you've heard, I'm the current chair. Uh, and along with my colleagues, it's, uh, it's great to have new, new faces, but it's also nice to see some of my colleagues uh, joining in and, and cheerleading and supporting this, uh, this important introduction. So uh, my part of the story is the big picture, uh, which is simply meant to say, how do Tadwig standards foster um, biodiversity research? What's the connection to um, sort of how the standards move up and are applied to data and also implemented in various uh, softwares, et cetera? So that is my goal. And I can't move my slides forward that way. Let's see, okay. Um, so just a quick overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about biodiversity informatics. Some of you will know what the biodiversity knowledge graph is, I'll talk about that, an alliance, uh, and finally a little bit more about our upcoming um, TADWIG conference in October. So I'm going to use the classic stool analogy uh, because I think it's quite appropriate and easy to discuss how standards fit in. Um, so if we look at uh, the legs of the stool at the bottom, we see that there are generally three of them, where standards is one, but obviously we have the data generators, the people providing data, and we have the infrastructure uh, and the tools necessary to do something with that data. So you can see those as the three legs. Now, our field or domain, whatever you want to call it, biodiversity informatics, is like the stool. It relies on all, or, sorry, well, the seat of the stool. It relies on the legs, uh, the data and the infrastructure and those standards. And today, I think it's, it's sort of nicely standardized in this um, term FAIR. Uh, and so we really are, with our piece of the data, we are looking at making them findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and of course, why do we do that? Well, Yes, it's fun and interesting to us, uh, but we're really serving a greater cause, and that is to produce data that is fit for the use of researchers and end users, uh, and there are many of those. Uh, and so this is sort of how the standards being one of the legs fits into a bigger picture, and I'll go into this in a little more detail. So classically, uh, we're dealing with observation, uh, and so, what is that? Well, we're really dealing with the who, what, where, when, and how of biodiversity. Um, some of us do the actual field work leading to collections or observations, which are then processed and, and that data is used for, for um, in, in research. Because of the strong connection to vouchering uh, and maintaining a record of things, we're also fairly closely um, allied with our colleagues in the natural science collections. So, so there's a strong link there. But what's interesting, and of course, over time, uh, technology changes. And with the, with the advances of technology, we've been able to get much closer to things that we didn't know so much about, but that's creating new types of data for us. So two obvious examples are the molecular ones. So we've done, gone through DNA barcoding, we use eDNA, we're doing metagenomics to discover different small parts of life that we didn't know much about in their relationships. And also sensor-based, so we have remote sensing and biologging, these sort of exciting new ways to monitor and track biodiversity that we didn't have easy access to before. These are creating literally a deluge of data that uh, needs standardization. So the key here, I think, is that standards, we're always needing to evolve and change the standards that we have. And there are always new communities joining us and technology is driving sort of these new uh, data types. So when you look in a bigger picture, this is, comes from the Global Biodiversity Information Outlook that was developed a few years ago now. When you look in the big picture, standards, of course, are only one little piece of the puzzle. They're crucial, but they're one piece of, of a bigger puzzle that biodiversity informatics sort of represents. And I think the, the message here that we're trying to send is there's something in here for everybody. So no matter where you're coming from, uh, you may not be the, you know, sort of core standards person, but we rely, there are many other pieces to the puzzle of what biodiversity informatics represents. And therefore, you know, for newcomers, I think there's always some, somewhere you can fit in this, this bigger story. 
So let's talk a little bit about the biodiversity uh, knowledge graph. This is a concept that's been around for a little while now. Uh, we give Rod Page, one of our colleagues, uh, sort of credit for really documenting this. Um, but the idea is to take these different types of data, data that come from many different places and to try to integrate them. Uh, and in trying to integrate them and look at the relationships between them, we really rely on standards. And in a semantic, from a semantic perspective, we use ontologies to talk about the relationships between data. So not just the data itself, but what is that data related to? And you see from the arrows in these different types of data that there are obvious relationships. Now, those relationships rely on another kind of standard, which are called identifiers. Those identifiers have to track the data at the level of records and sometimes at the level of the data um, themselves in order to allow those relationships to be built and to be tracked. Uh, this is not a simple thing to do. Uh, and I have to admit that we are still struggling a bit in places to really make this uh, uh, work completely. But uh, it's another kind of standard that is essential to this process. So from the bottom up, you have the data generators, the data providers. They provide the different kinds of data you see here. Uh, and then the end users around the outside, super important both the researchers who are putting data in or the researchers who are taking data out and all kinds of other users, uh, people from policy, politics, regulation, you name it, we influence everyone. But the key point here is that these people are able to look into this graph, to mine this graph, create new knowledge and provide feedback and help the knowledge improve uh, inside the graph itself. Now, if we look at that a little closer, and focus in on those uh, circles that you see there and their relationships, we, we look at sort of this distributed system of services. So each of these uh, can, be, can provide information and what we wanna do is interconnect them in order to make the graph stronger. So we have from, let's see, moving from right to left, we have the providers. Uh, we have providers who are providing the observation data and coming into uh, aggregators like GBIF, iDigBio, Atlas of Living Australia, and others. We have, we have um, data coming from literature. The Biodiversity Heritage Library has been essential to that. Uh, we, have the, we have the standards themselves. We have nomenclators providing that bottom layer of taxonomy, and then the interpreted part of taxonomy being the catalogs of what species we really have. Um, we have the people and places. We have to keep track of the people and places in things like GRBio. And those new types of data, I've only highlighted one here, the sequence data coming from places like NCBI and the BOLD systems. So all of these can be interconnected. Uh, and this, what's essential here is that the services that you see around those outside those have to be sustainable. Our community relies on those. Uh, and so one of our challenges is how to maintain these standards at a high level. And in order to, in order to do that, um, they all rely on standards. So moving to sort of the bigger picture of thinking about how in a global sense do we coordinate better what we do, uh, Tadwick has joined uh, this concept of an alliance the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge. This is rather a new thing and we're really only in its infancy, but it is a crucial um, part of our evolution. And so this was uh, done a few years ago, uh, but it, it really, as it says, proposes a coordination mechanism for developing shared roadmaps for biodiversity informatics. So what we're trying to say is that, you know, many of these services that we all rely on are bigger than just the people who created them in the first place. And therefore, we have to build on those and we have to, as a community, global community, try to sustain them. And not only that, we also know that in different parts of the world, we're duplicating things. And duplication in science isn't really bad. It's a good way to test things. But in the end, when you want to rely on a service, we have to all get together, build on standards, implement those services and sustain them. And that really sometimes takes a global initiative beyond just the smaller uh, units that maybe have started some of these services. So we're really looking at a sustainable model. And uh, if I didn't say it already, uh, GBIF is the coordinating mechanism for this at the moment. Uh, and I expect in the uh, near future to see more activity here. 
So looking a little bit about uh, what's coming up in the uh, October sessions, because this is the place that is sort of the, um, our, our biodiversity information showcase. So Tadwig has sort of this uh, little bit of a dichotomy going where we are a standards body and we take that standards development very seriously. And that's what you'll see through our working groups this week. But we also have sort of become a forefront of um, the implementation side of standards in, in the sense of biodiversity informatics. And that's what our conference in October really represents. Every year we try to have some kind of theme that seems relevant to the times. Uh, I should say that we developed this theme before the COVID uh, situation occurred. So, uh, but I think there's many ways that you can see that this theme is, is um, re relevant to that. So we're talking about integrating data from local to global solutions. And I think in some ways it's, it's just very simple that all of the local places, they have needs and requirements, some of which they can handle themselves, but many like standards are above, you know, well, not above, are beyond them and involve a broader community. And so the local can drive requirements and have great ideas, and those can be pushed into the global. And the global has the ability to provide those standards and services at that level, which then are pushed back to the local to use. And then as you can see, of course, there becomes a feedback loop. So that loop says, oh, thank you for those services, but they could be improved on and I've got some ideas. Or thank you for the solutions, the tools. That's a great tool, but it'd be just that much better if we could do this. Or in our case, the standards. Hey, that's a great standard, but now I have this kind of data and there's a little, there's two or three pieces of that puzzle that aren't represented in the standard. How, how can those be added? And so there's a feedback loop that moves from local to global. So focusing on, on the conference itself, uh, that third week of, of October, I'm really excited to say that, uh, this has been the sort of fast and furious, uh, that we now have two uh, great plenary speakers. Um, we have Dr. Scott Edwards, who some of you might know, he's an ornithologist and curator at uh, Harvard University. And uh, he did something sort of interesting earlier this year. He went on a bike tour uh, to look at birds across uh, North America. And uh, in his tour, he went through the times of COVID, uh, which I thought was brave and interesting. And at the same time, he, uh, he went through uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, and, and looked at that from his perspective. So he's gonna be able to share, the, uh, I think, a really interesting perspective and story for us. And we're also uh, happy to have someone from iNaturalist joining us. Uh, some of you saw that talk last year, uh, maybe if you attended uh, Biodiversity Next. It won't be exactly uh, sort of in that frame, but uh, we think that what the, this um, um, citizen science platform represents for identification and really engaging the public, uh, that this is a really exciting thing to keep talking about. And uh, they're actually driving some really interesting imaging technology and recognition. So that's exciting. Uh, we have nine symposia with a very diverse uh, set of talks. Um, there is a poster session and we'll have three panel discussions as well. And as was mentioned earlier by my colleagues, uh, all of these abstracts are about to be uh, published in, in our journal, Biodiversity Information Science and Standards. So you'll have easy connection to that both before and after the conference. And some of the topics there, uh, moving beyond just the titles of the symposia, you'll see there's some generalizations of things that are very sort of interesting at these, in these times, things like data integration, visualization, interoperability, but also starting to talk about that sustainable development, uh, how do we maintain these services that we have. And another thing that's, that's really become important is how to bring credit and attribution to the people who do the various types of curation and tool building and publishing. So these are exciting times and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to your participation both this week and uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. And I'll take any questions or we'll all take your questions now. The floor is open. And we'd also just like to acknowledge and thank um, our, thank, thank the sponsors, um, thank yes. the supporters of um, of both of the conference uh, conferences, even though they're online, they're not uh, they're not free to run. So uh, we're very appreciative of those organisations listed on on the splash screen who have helped us out.
So, Ellie, should I leave that splash screen there? No, let's have people's faces back. All right. Did I break the share or is it still going? Uh, no, you have to still keep unsharing. Yes, I need my controls back here. Wherever they have gone. So in the meantime, Holly, I, do you want to is, uh, let us into any questions that have come through? Sure. Um, I am going to ask the question of this one, but I would suggest possibly everyone to look at the rest of the comment from Carlos. Um, the question is, if there are any interest groups or task groups related to publishing and reusing standardized data at the journal and article levels. There is a very great vision outlined in this question as well. There is, yes, indeed. I think the person that we need perfectly to answer that question um, would be one of our um, Platzi collaborators, but I don't think Donat's on the call um, or anybody else. James, have you got any thoughts to share? I'm sorry, I was uh, desperately trying to break my share. Uh, which yeah. question are we looking at? <laughs> this is uh, Carlos. I can see your face on the on the um, uh, ah, this on is the Carlos screen. Question. Okay. Would you like to unmute yourself and describe a little more about uh, what you're thinking of? Because it's a great idea. Hi, many thanks. Um, so I'm talking from Turku, uh, Finland. Yeah, I am. Um, I was asking about uh, how to reuse data, not just at the level of aggregators and sharing, but also to reuse them at the level of articles. So we already know that the, there is an interest for um, reuse as you write and format as you write, because we see it, for example, in pens of journals. But then at the same time, we have uh, many institutions that are using the, the open journal systems, and we still don't have a tool for doing uh, similar things in the, in the open journal systems and to use Darwin Core and ABCD and so to reuse data that is already there. So I was asking if there is an interest group already working on that. So the easy answer is no, there's not. Would you like to start one? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there, are, if there are more people interested and if we could get someone from the, from the public knowledge project on board, it would be really interesting. And now Europe uh, has uh, funding for working on the open science, the European open science cloud. So I think that uh, having uh, European partners could get us closer to having funding to support the, the jobs making this tool possible. So, but yeah, hmm. we could we could have a interest group on that. I, I sign in. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I do know that we've got a couple of people who are being a bit quiet um, on the chat, but who have certainly had a lot to do with um, literature in the past. And I'm going to um, ask William if you have anything to say about. Um, literature? Well, just that uh, it, it is a topic coming up in, in several of the groups this year. Um, I know the uh, taxonomy and concepts has that topic to be resolved. The, uh, there's an um, annotations group also that, that's probably going to mention that. And uh, in the talks, maybe, in, I'm not sure in this week, but the week in October, um, there's a whole uh, group talking about this issue. I also, I also know that um, the European journals have a consortium that are looking into actually implementing that for all their production. So the topic of generating uh, content that's already structured in a way that can be reutilized, it's a very live that one, but there's no group yet. Not even our literature interest group is, is uh, talking on that. That could be actually if there's a group a task group that could be formed to do that, those kind of things proposed within the literature interest group. Now, I do know that we've got our, um, uh, so the Biodiversity Heritage Library is obviously very 
uh, very interested in literature and is moving more and more into um, uh, in copyright literature and digital literature. Um, she might say no, but Nicole Carney, did you have anything that you would like to add into this topic? You can say no. I think people can hear me. Sorry, it's very dark in the room I'm in. Um, I should turn the light on. Certainly, um, we're very, very interested in open access to literature. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm looking specifically at the, I didn't pop up earlier because the question seemed to be particularly related to standardised data. Um, we're doing a lot of work in terms of publishing and reusing journals and journal articles, particularly retrospectively assigning, um, assigning data, data article metadata to those articles, but also um, DOIs to those. So I'd certainly be very interested in joining a literature task group around this, um, but if it's specifically related to standardised data within that, um, that's sort of the next step in our current project. Um, does that help, Ellie? I'm not. <laughs> it does. That's great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, for those who don't Nic know Nicole, who just spoke up, she's the Biodiversity Heritage Library Program Manager for Australia. Um, so, uh, a good person to ask about literature. Um, there's another question that's come through about whether there's any interest group in life sounds or in colours. Paula, do you want to take that one? Sure, I just answered on chat. I, I'm not sure I know what what uh, what this question refers to because it might seem like there is, there could be a mix of topics there. So some interest group that might be relevant are the observations and specimens and the machine observations. But it depends on what the re really the topics are. Maybe the colors would be more towards vocabularies. So um, I'm not I'm not sure if if you can explain a little bit more what is your 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 topic of interest um, also, um, oh. go um, ahead patricia yeah hello it's patricia here uh, yes basically we want to uh, describe uh, the data flow from where we capture uh, the observation the images are captured from from the sensors all the way to a data central portal, which I potentially will be Emonet Biology. So we, are, we want to write, uh, we want to find what is all the metadata that it needs to be incorporated with uh, all the terms, vocabularies, so everything involved in this. And it's specifically for images taken from sensors. So that's why I'm a bit confused because there is the machine observation group, there is also Audubon, which has all these term lists for images, describing images. Uh, and yeah, a few other groups that also I think they could be, it could be relevant. Well, if I, if I jump in here, I think a couple of things are true here. So you'll see some natural overlap between our own uh, groups where uh, one might touch the other. And this is where we have to talk to each other. Uh, we talked about that technical architecture group, sort of trying to make sure that the pieces of the puzzle are separated and make sense where they are. Um, so we, we do pay attention to that. But something I would highlight from, from your question, Patricia, and, and uh, an earlier one that came in, is uh, we are not alone in the standards world. Uh, and so many times we're borrowing from other standards bodies that exist. So we borrow heavily from the library community, for example. Uh, we, we even borrow terms from ISO, but uh, standardized geospatial terms, we don't reinvent wheels. Uh, we simply try to coordinate things that make sense in our community's perspective. And uh, what you represent are looking for those, the use cases that we, to bring forward where we see gaps. And then we try to address those gaps one way or another. So the value of you to join any of those that um, interest groups is to present those use cases and then we'll try to help you sort out where best that question should be addressed and, and work towards them. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I've been in touch already with Steve from the Audubon Court oh, and yes. I have, I have uh, uh, I've been digging into all the documentation for the Audubon and I see they borrow also 
uh, terms from Darwin Core, and this is actually what we want to look at. Uh, we are looking at uh, some terms from Darwin Core, but for uh, specifically for some metadata for the images, it's more appropriate the one from uh, Audubon. So for sure, I, I see that we don't want to invent anything, but just see what is existing and recommend what to use. Uh, that's so, fantastic, yeah. Patricia. Thanks for engaging and you're in good hands with Steve, we can say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for your, for your answer. So stay, stay there, Patricia, because uh, we've also got um, Peggy Newman, who's the co convener of the um, Machine Observations Interest Group um, on the call, which is great. So I'll hand over to Peggy to make a few comments about that group. Um, okay. Yeah, hi Patricia and hi, hi everyone. Sorry, um, that, I think that's a really good question and, um, you know, and that's right, there's overlap between, uh, between the groups and I think the, for the Machine Observations Group, um, our focus is about how to manage that metadata um, that comes with sensors because there's a lot of it and it's uh, uh, a lot of different types of sensors and a lot of different information that needs to come with them for um, you know, for those observations to be able to be used sensibly in any kind of analysis. So uh, I think that's been an interesting question for us because we've considered camera trap data to be part of our remit, but um, yeah, how that, how that overlaps with, um, with Audubon Core, I guess, is, is something we haven't really um, gotten particularly clear. We've been mostly focused on biologging data in general and, um, you know, spatially, um, you know, spatially following around a tagged animal. Um, okay. But that's a really good question and, um, yeah, come okay. along to the session and bring it to us. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, Patricia. Okay. Um, now, I don't think, I think the, the chat questions have gone a little quiet for the moment, um, which means that I've got to ask questions that I've made up, which none of you really want to hear. Um, but I do know that we've got some very long-term participants in Tadwig on the line uh, or on the call. Um, and I'm wondering if any of them um, who are hiding there without their video cameras on would like to join in to, um, just for the new people into the, coming into the community, um, just to, if anyone would like to say, what are, what are some of the things that you've appreciated about Tadwig? Um, or um, are proud to have been involved with um, as over the time that you've been in Tadwig. Arthur Chapman, your name is right in the middle of my screen. So I'm going to ask, put, <laughs> put the hard word on you. <laughs> I've been involved with Tadwig since 1971, I think. So quite a long time and been involved with a lot of aspects of Tadwick and uh, currently I'm um, convener of the data quality interest group and we have um, four task groups as has been mentioned already. Um, Tadwick is, is many things to a lot of people and to me it's, it's amazing and that graph that you put up of the interactions between people um, is quite interesting because you see at different times through history that different parts of the, that graph are stronger and but people interact all the time. And the thing about Tadwig I think is to me, one is that it's an open, anybody can be involved, that you don't need any real expertise to help out with, with some of these um, task groups and interest groups. And the sec uh, second one is the camaraderie between people. You go to the various meetings around the world and it's a real family of people with, with um, similar interests. So just not the standards, but the camaraderie and the, and, and the um, um, I suppose the, the aims to get things out there and, and available. And it's interesting to see Tadwig change over the time. When I first became interested, it was mainly botanical information. And we um, 
it was mainly books and things like that, authors' names and BPH. And then in 1971 or 1972, a meeting in Jalapa, Mexico, was the first time we really started to get into digital. I remember Walter Ber Berenson from Berlin coming out and showing a entity relationship diagram. And then Jim Croft from Canberra came and put another big wa wiring diagram on the screen. And that's when we started to change and we became more than just botanical data, but um, information on right across biology. And then for a while it became real technical, the technical aspects. Uh, and now it's coming back to the data and the information side. So it evolves over time and it will continue to evolve and I think it will be around for a long time. And we've become more um, structured in the way we deal with things in recent times and I think that's a good thing. But the people they're talking about um, colour and life sounds. If you're involved with the Audubon Corps or the um, Machine Observations Group and you see that they're not quite fitting what you want, then think about starting your own task group to deal with that under one of those interest groups so that you can bring your task into it. And the one there on um, the publishing things, if this uh, not, there may be an interest group that you can start a task group underwards and task groups come and they go. They have an achievable end. Interest groups tend to stay on for a long time and new task groups come under them, new task groups disappear. I think that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, I can, I know that there's at least one other, um, uh, one other executive committee member who's online who might like to have a go at that question. Um, Valter, um, would you like to tell us about anything that you have appreciated about TADWIG or, pr or proud to be involved with? Thanks. Um, yeah, I've also been involved uh, a long time uh, in, in TADWIG, uh, I think about 15 years. And um, I, I would like to, to emphasize this Archer already said that uh, TEDFIC is really two things. Uh, one is, is it is the biodiversity information standards uh, themselves. But second, it is the community. And that also materializes uh, in a uh, sense that we, we have all these tasks, these, these interest groups working on these standards, but we also have these annual uh, meetings which are equally important. So it's both the community and it's the standards themselves. Um, I've been involved in the development of, of uh, several standards. Um, I'm currently involved in, in the collection description standards uh, from, uh, from my position in uh, DISCO, a new infrastructure on uh, collections in Europe. Um, and from that infrastructure, um, there are also some activities going on now to create some uh, new task groups. Um, and uh, which, which are related to, uh, to specimens. So um, as, as Arthur said, yeah, the, 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 the focus at, at this point in time is a little bit on, on, on uh, back to the data itself. So we, we uh, are discussing uh, a model uh, for, uh, for specimens, a global model for specimens with extended uh, specimen data. Um, all the, all the data that can be derived from, from specimens held in, in Musea. Um, and we, we are talking about setting up um, uh, a task group that, that has just been initiated on the minimum um, information uh, uh, on digitization of, of specimens. Um, so these, these are uh, a, a lot of new activities going on and we have the uh, currently very active uh, collection descriptions uh, task group. Um, uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, time again for, for TEDRIC, I think. Okay. Um, I might ask James, as someone who's been very involved with TADWIG um, and has, is currently the chair of TADWIG, uh, what's something that you've been proud of with uh, being involved with TADWIG? 
and particularly over the last couple of years being um, the face of Tadwig. Well, I think uh, I think I'm proud of lots of things. Uh, you know, I I should say that you know I'm a botanist by training, and I've been part of the biodiversity informatics world for going 20 years plus. Um, but uh, I love the challenges. I mean, I, I I just love the challenges involved in both the, the um, standards themselves and the and the tool generation. And I think uh, as as Arthur has said and and sort of loves the, I've been focused on the. Um, the, the fitness part of this and, and trying to make the data as fit for people's use as possible. And, and one of the things that, that I've really enjoyed is uh, the annotation side of things. I, I want the round tripping. I really, uh, I really want the feedback loop to get everyone's knowledge, everybody's information in that, that graph and, and to be as, as high quality as possible. And there are still incredible challenges there. Uh, you know, we have technology is changing technology is, is really uh, uh, impressive, but it's, it's also daunting. And, it, and it's, you know, I talked a little bit about uh, that infrastructure that we need, that global infrastructure. And I really see that as true now. And, and it's sort of part of the new, the new fight to, to make our, our stuff sustainable at a level that makes it even more useful. And uh, that's bigger than us. So I think one of the challenges that I've embraced and, and that I see is, you know, sort of being really truly global. We're, we're at a time now where we can be that way and we have to think that way. And all of us have our projects and our little pieces of the puzzle, but we all have to come together at, you know, as a strength to focus on these core services that we all need. And so uh, these are exciting times. Uh, and you know, I didn't say this earlier, but uh, you know, I think all of you who have paid attention to, uh, to the COVID story, you can't help but pay attention to it. One of the things you've probably noticed if you're the kind of person like I am, is just how messy the data and the ability for them to generate you know, good stories from it is. So you know, we're quite connected to this. Viruses are you know, part of our ballywick, I would say. And uh, also, of course, the vectors for those viruses and so we have a strong piece and you'll see some of this coming in our uh, in talk in our sessions and also at the conference, there's a whole session on this to try and help where we can to say, well, that information is critical. And those relationships I told you about between hosts and their various, uh, um, well, the hosts themselves and how they interact with those viruses and that whole system approach that, that is standards driven and, and that needs our tools, it needs our people. So we have a strong piece of that, uh, that story and, and a responsibility to it. So I think what's interesting is that the landscape changes underneath us very quickly, but uh, it, is, it just says to me how reliant, how important it is to have these standards uh, and to be able to produce the tools on top of them that, that really help biodiversity along. We're in a time of crisis. Biodiversity, every report we read now says that biodiversity is at a time of crisis. And so we need all hands on deck. We need everybody contributing to try and solve problems, make, meet these great challenges. So I, I just always, you know, I wake up every day and I, I, I like my job and I, I'm really excited to continue uh, in the research side, but also um, I've really enjoyed leading uh, Tadwig. And I should say that my time is, uh, is drawing near here. So uh, we, have, we have terms that come to an end. So something that's exciting for some of you to think about is that we'll be looking for a new chair and several new people on the executive. So those of you who are excited, and it doesn't matter how much time you've put in in the Tadwick sphere, it just matters that you're excited and enthusiastic about what we do. And so uh, Deb Paul, who you'll see a little later, she's taking over the reins as chair starting next year. So we'll be looking for a new deputy chair and we'll be uh, moving forward as we do. So uh, that's my So piece. thank you, James. That's a nice segue into um, one of our, our the, uh, another exec member who's on the line uh, is Brenda Daly, who's coming to us from South Africa, who um, uh, I think would um, be able to just talk very um, briefly about, because we're coming close to time, about uh, the, how she got involved in Tadwig in the first place. Um, and then we have got one extra, one more question, which could take us another half an hour, um, but we'll just 
very quickly see if there's any response to that. But firstly, Brenda, um, how did you get involved in Tadwig? Uh, standards. Um, they handed me a massive document that was highly technical and wow. And it's from that point on that I realized that this was a massive opportunity. And I was very uh, grateful for the opportunity when I was asked to get involved with Tadwick. And it's really been an amazing experience because you, you, you realize the kind of depth and the commitment that many people within Tadwick have around getting standards and getting biodiversity data on board. It is it's brilliant. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Brenda. So Joseph has asked a really interesting question that's had a couple of responses already, but we've only got three minutes left, so I don't know how much we can delve into it. Um, I think Carlos and Joseph are already going to go and talk offline. Um, well, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do um, about, uh, about the, the proposal. Um, so Joseph says he's writing software tools to aid researchers to publish and promote data under fair principles. Um, He's interested to get a, an idea of how the tools can link in with existing data standards. So um, because we don't have very much time to discuss it, um, Joseph, would you like to come off mute um, and just give us a little bit more description about what you're interested in and then in the shared document, we can share some responses. There might be the best thing to do. Um. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Yeah, um, there's some drilling going on here, so hopefully that doesn't pick, get picked up on the microphone. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a complete newbie here, so um, this might, might have been a silly question as well, but uh, I've been developing uh, a set of software uh, tools as part of a bigger consortium. I'm, I'm only a sort of quite junior member of that consortium. Um, but it's, yeah, as, as you said, it's been trying to promote the use uh, of and uh, the sharing of data under fair principles. And I think a lot of the barriers to some of the research community here in, in adopting th these sort of things is that actually they find the existing tools quite intimidating, I think. And so we've been just trying to smooth over that a little bit more. And so my reason for joining today was trying to get more, bit, more of an idea about the data standards and the groups uh, controlling them so that we can write better tools that link in better with them. But my, yeah, my question was really a bit more about um, like as to uh, to the extent to which TIFIG sort of is interested in guiding these tools or, co or or curating those tools in and of themselves or whether they more just leave that to the sort of separate groups who are developing them. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure about and, and, and sticking directly to the standards. Like I know that, I, for example, I do see there is an example of an IPT task group here. So so I, I, I understood that you definitely um, were interested to a certain extent with the development of these tools but yeah i was just wondering like sort of you know where 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 the cutoff is um i, pr I probably phrased that very badly so <laughs> no no that's perfect james you have 30 seconds to respond huh. so uh all i can say is that uh, you know we've said a little bit about our dichotomy you know, we develop standards that technical work uh, and review process and publication ratification. So that part's important to us. And what's important to us if you are a tool maker is that you embrace our standards so that the tools that you develop and the data that comes from them is integratable in the big picture. Uh, so that's important to us. Our other side of our dichotomy though is a huge group of biodiversity informaticians. We're all tool makers. Uh, and so, you have an alliance of all of us to help with that and to help you. Uh, there are many, uh, many you can choose from. And I think in joining the sessions, you'll get to know those people. You'll sort of sift through those people yourself to see who most closely aligns. And you can reach out to those people and we'll sort of foster you along uh, if you have questions. So that, that's what the community piece that Arthur spoke about uh, and that I reiterate is, is really important. We are a community and, uh, and we'll help you. Okay, that is fantastic. Um, thank you very much. I know, um, uh, Joseph, that doesn't really answer your question, but certainly asks, uh, certainly opens up a discussion, which is um, fabulous. And we hope that that exact sort of discussion is what we can um, hope for the rest of rest of the week. Um, 
So with that, uh, we come to the end of our session today. Um, that seemed to go past very quickly. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we can't promise that there'll be any more dinosaurs uh, um, uh, joining us as they did last year. But uh, coming up soon in a couple of hours, we have the discussion group on Audubon Core, followed by the collections descriptions discussion group, um, and then the second, um, the second session of the intro to Tadwig um, meeting. So there's more things coming up today. There's lots on during the week. Um, I would like to thank all of the presenters who, uh, who came and um, generously, very generously got up at um, very early hours of the morning. And for those of us who didn't need to get up at early hours of the morning, thank you very much, Marika. Um, uh, thank you all for your participation and your questions. And we will look forward to uh, seeing you um, over the over the Zoom calls over the during the course of the week and also in October. So thank you all and have a good evening, day, morning, afternoon, wherever, wherever it is that you're up to. Thanks all. Bye everyone. Um, I will make a quick note. I am copying the chat, but I need to go through and take out the behind the scenes chatting. And we start the recording. The document. Ah, yeah.